Welcome. Good morning, everyone, to Community Circles and Conversations. I'm Bree Ann Sanchez, Director of Nonprofit Relations here at the Community Foundation of Greater Des Moines, and it is wonderful um, to see you all again on the call today. Let's uh, quick go through some of our announcements for everybody. Um, Barb, if you would take us through. Oh, actually. We'll set the scene. <laughs> uh, reminder, our goals for these sessions are to uh, build trusting relationships and share knowledge and resources with the Central Iowa nonprofit sector. Uh, we expect those who participate will center dialogue around those goals and remain rooted in equity and inclusion. And if you are not presenting, a reminder to please mute um, or turn off your video during the presentations, and then we'll invite you to turn on your video um, when we and, and unmute when we go into the breakouts. So if folks want to take a minute to do that, and I will say we're going to try something <laughs> in breakouts. Uh, there was a Zoom update that I think may allow us to invite you to select your breakout room without doing the whole change your name and then we'll zoom you appropriately into the breakout room of your choice. So <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to trying that experiment and if it doesn't work, we'll go back to the way we had been doing things, but um, thought this would be fun. So welcome folks, I see some new faces, um, new names on the call. Just invite you to turn off your video and um, stay muted while uh, we have our presentation and then um, we'll turn those on when we join our breakouts. All right, let's go to the announcements for this week. And um, wanted to share, if you haven't seen, our leadership grants were announced uh, last week, I believe. And we'll have some more information coming out in our nonprofit newsletter. You can find all of our grant making information also on our website, which I will pop into the chat here. Um, but February 25th is the date to pay attention to. That's when our letters of intent for leadership grants are due. Um, for this first cycle. Uh, we also have two uh, very exciting trainings on, on deck, virtual audit prep. I know that gets everybody in this group really jazzed. Um, on February 18th and priority management, kind of a more general topic for everybody who's spinning all the plates right now um, on March 30th. So you can check out uh, those opportunities on our website as well. The virtual audit prep is free. So um, share that with your finance team or committee if you are looking for an opportunity to dig into learning there. Um, I also wanted to uh, lift up Iowa Legal Aid's Community Economic Development Project, uh, hosting a free legal compliance training February 13th, I think that's a Saturday. Um, and we'll have some more information about that in our nonprofit link as well. And I know, I think that they're running registration through an Eventbrite. And then there is a virtual mini conference, Volunteer Managers of Central Iowa will be hosting on March 26th. So even when we're apart, there are many opportunities to come together and learn. Uh, let's, uh, Go to the next slide, please. All right, so we have a really wonderful group of presenters and uh, one of our presenters is still joining us right now. So I'll, I'll give a minute before I do some introductions here, but I wanted in that time to just share a quote that I found when I was reading. Um, this is, I, sometimes I give book recommendations. So this is the book that I um, have been most recently reading um, for kind of the connectivity with what we're doing when we come together each week. It is uh, Turning to One Another by Margaret Wheatley, Simple Conversations to Restore Hope in the Future. So I thought since today is a future-focused conversation that that might be a fun one um, to showcase, but it's, it's 
about 20 years old, but it feels extremely timely um, with sort of just the environment that we're in right now. Um, and this quote here, we don't set out to save the world. We set out to wonder how other people are doing and to reflect on how our actions affect other people's hearts um, was one of the passages that was used as a reflection in the book. And is a kind of a cool uh, format where just kind of like room to breathe in the middle of it and some good questions. So um, recommend this book. I think I, I found it actually through a post Bobby Segura, who I know joins us on occasion, had made. It was recommended by a few local consultants. So really enjoyed that one. So on to the future as we'll share it today. We have joining us um, as presenters, Sarah Dixon. She is Senior Director of Partnerships and Development for the Iowa Primary Care Association. And then Leslie Wright, who's a longtime nonprofit leader and owner of Collective Clarity. And Leslie is joining us from Eastern Iowa today. So I don't know if you have the same frost situation going on over there, Leslie, but um, great to have you both. <laughs> Sarah, I'll invite you to turn on your camera, if you will, and unmute and Leslie the same. Um, and then I also wanted to call out Amanda Martin from Drake University's Engaged Citizen Corps uh, program. They are, uh, she's gonna talk a little bit in a breakout if you're interested in working with the Drake students um, on their Engaged Citizen projects. Um, there'll be an opportunity for you to have some time with her as one of the breakout options. So did want to call that out. So welcome to Sarah and Leslie. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. And I want to confirm that Sarah is with us. I saw her zooming in and it looked like she was maybe having a little bit of trouble getting logged in today, which sometimes is the name of the game. So we can always switch it up if we need to. Um, but Sarah would invite you to unmute and share your video if you'd like. Um, and then we'll we'll get started. And I would like to say that I have had so many, you know, wonderful meetings during this time, but meeting with Sarah and talking about some of the projects that they have underway and meeting with Leslie, those were two opportunities over the past couple of months where I have left the meeting with so much more energy and excitement than when I started. And, and I think that's the sign of just really great people um, to work with. So uh, Sarah, if you are with us, feel free to introduce yourself. If we're having technical difficulties, we can give you a minute. She's logging in again. All right. Well, let's uh, go to the next slide real quick. Brianne, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, we don't need to see you. It's okay if you if you <laughs> if we can hear you, that'll be that'll be just fine. Okay. I'm so sorry. I am on my phone and the computer, um, and this seems to be working on my phone. So I'll just uh, go this way today. All right. <laughs> that works. Going. <laughs> we can we can roll with that. We've got all the slides on our end, so it's all good. Um, so we will talk a little bit first with Sarah about how uh, the Iowa Primary Care Association leverage this idea of working with a futurist um, to do some strategic scenario planning. If you want to just uh, start, Sarah, by sharing a little bit about that project, and we can go to the next slide. Um, you can also tell us a little bit more about Iowa Primary Care Association, because I love theory, but I think we also crave examples of how theory gets put into action. Um, and this is just a really cool, cool one. So take it away, Sarah. Tell us a little bit more about who you guys are and what your process was. Well, thank you for um, allowing me to join. And um, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I will be working here on my IT to try to get on video eventually. But um, I'm Sarah Dixon, and I work for the Iowa Primary Care Association, which um, is a statewide association of community health centers. And um, I know that this um, group that uh, Brianne and the Greater Des Moines Community Foundation facilitate, you know, would typically has probably Des Moines um, or Central Iowa focused organizations typically. And so the health center that is in the Des Moines area um, is primary health care. And there are 13 other health centers across um, the state. And so our mission um, 
is really to provide, um, you know, enhance capacity to health centers and their ability to care. Um, our vision is health equity for all. And then I shared our values with you. And um, we, um, we collectively actually, um, Brianne, if you wanna go to that next slide, um, serve over you know, 200,000 Iowans. And um, I included a map so all of you could see where the clinic locations are of the health centers. And so on that map, um, there's a little house for kind of the main clinic sites. And then you can see where they've got um, satellite locations in some other parts of the state. Um, we do um, actually provide services to a health center in Nebraska. So you get the Nebraska map as well. Um, and um, we, as part of our, just to kind of get more into the, um, the reason that we were thinking about doing scenario planning and um, thinking about the future is we, um, as a nonprofit, completed our uh, strategic planning process um, and had landed on our vis vision, mission, and values before the pandemic. And then we were working on our um, goals and objectives um, as that hit. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the goals that we have, um, and actually you can probably go to the next slide, Brian. I think I've got those stacked up there. Um, or no, that's, that's kind of more information about our patients. So you can kind of pause there and let people take a look. But um, we were really focused on, um, our, our top goal was preparing for the future. And so um, this, the position that I'm in, as well as the work I'm doing is kind of a newly created role. And, um, our board wanted to ensure that we were, um, while we put out fires on our day-to-day -day work, we were really pointed at um, what we need to do as an organization as a, and as a network of health centers to prepare for the future. And so there were um, three different things within that goal. One of them was the annual scenario planning that we'll be talking about today. Um, I also um, did some a, a strategic plan uh, review to look for areas of alignment among the health center strategic plans and our strategic plan. And then we are doing some um, access and infrastructure kind of incubator, um, health center incubator work um, as well within that goal. Um, but the, this idea to, to really focus in on scenario planning, um, we had done uh, kind of an attempt at scenario planning uh, previously, and it went, it was very good. It came, we, we ended up with some really wonderful outcomes. And um, I think we really want to, as we've grown up as an organization, we want to be doing annual scenario planning um, on, an, on an annual basis. And so it's something that um, we, we knew we needed to look for some expertise. So um, I'm here with Leslie Wright out of Cedar Rapids and um, we wanted to start to think like practical futurists. And we had heard of Leslie and um, had had a number of colleagues in the Cedar Rapids area that had worked with her. Um, and so we were like, we don't exactly know um, the best way to go about annual scenario planning. So let's bring in a guide. And um, what we ended up doing was really, um, there's our goal. So you can see that prepare for the future goal. And um, we, we use that goal to really inform the other nine um, that are in that uh, visual. And then um, Brianne, if you wanna go to that next slide, I think I just captured really at a high level um, what we were focused on was scenario planning. Um, so we, scenario planning is a huge topic. Um, and what we decided to do was really focus in on two of our kind of core areas of work. So that was uh, value-based care and then our vision of health equity. And um, we designed a one-day session for our community health center CEOs from across the state. And then we also asked them to bring um, other members of their leadership team uh, to, to go through the scenario planning um, event. And Really what Leslie um, and we worked on with Leslie is just how do you design a workshop that is not only, I think, engaging, interactive, and, um, and, and then also how, what is the process that we can go through to help get our leaders who are more so than ever with COVID really mired down in um, day to day, just putting out fires and, and what's, the, what's the way in which we can help these um, help these individuals, including ourselves, get into more of a future state. And so um, with Leslie's help, we designed a day that would um, not only frame out, I think where we were from our perspective with our strategic plan implementation, but we, um, we brought in Leslie to go through kind of a futurist, um, a series of exercises. And then we as staff did um, a number of things to prepare for that session. And so we, 
worked with Leslie to identify kind of key forces um, that were uh, really influencing our work. Um, we did an asset inventory um, ourselves and our health centers to really focus in on some of the things that we have in our network that are of value. And then we also developed um, three scenarios that would be um, kind of a new normal, um, ongoing uncertainty, and then a future that's bright. And um, we, we were able to share those uh, with the participants in advance. And then how we spent our time with them was actually um, doing some interactive exercises and then bringing in some subject matter experts to fill, facilitate breakouts that would identify um, basically prioritized activities that we could take as a group. Um, and I will say um, it was just, it was an excellent exercise um, in terms of just seeing where our health centers were, what opportunities they were seeing. So it brought, um, I would say, just like a positive energy. And um, it also, I would say, just allowed us to really make sense of the environment. And um, we picked the timing in December to um, accommodate not only the presidential election, but also um, giving us some time in advance of the state legislative, um, the state legislative uh, season. So, yeah. So, you know, just Brian, that's kind of a high level and kind of why we did it. And I'll pause there. Um, sure. I know Leslie has lots to share as well. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. And we have talked about scenario planning in this group, um, more uh, aligned with the financial scenario planning um, element. So if folks are interested, we had a session with Courtney Deronda um, from TDT, uh, probably close to the beginning of the pandemic that you can review as well. So this is a different kind of scenario planning, um, but uh, really appreciate your, your high level review. And then um, hopefully we'll have some time for breakouts where folks could ask you a little bit more specific questions um, later in the, the second half of our time. So Leslie, if you would like, um, and Barb, we can move along to the next slide to just share a little bit about your background and then um, a little bit about uh, the, the futures work that you've been doing. Um, so I come to you, in fact, I know several of you that are on the call today. I've skimmed through um, to see who all is here. I most recently uh, left 13 years as the Senior Vice President of Community Building for the United Way here in Cedar Rapids. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today reflects how I came to understand the challenges of setting direction in organizations in complex environments. So um, in the interest of time, we can move to the next slide. I'll just clip through these pretty quick. Uh, scenario planning and futurist thinking is an antidote to change that feels like you're standing in the tunnel and the train is headed towards you. Um, it can feel a little overwhelming Next slide. And um, what I have learned and a lot of what I'm gonna incorporate in my comments today came from going to futurist camp last summer. Rebecca Ryan is a well-known Midwestern futurist and uh, she asked the question, would you drive across the country using them? So often our planning processes by their very nature are backward looking. We're looking at historical data. We're looking at what we didn't accomplish last year. And so future thinking is really about um, also incorporating a look ahead as best we're able. Next slide. And futures thinking sounds, when I first heard it, I thought really, this is like sci-fi. This is not my gig, um, but it really isn't that. It's about, and this is a quote from Marina Gorbis, who is the founder of the Institute for Alternative Futures. She does a lot of scenario thinking and planning. You know, it isn't about predicting the future. It is instead about sort of changing the practice of our organizations. And one of the things I took away from working with Sarah and the Primary Care Association is the comments from the CEOs who said, you know, right now we're essentially doing all that we can. We're looking at our shoes. We're looking at the ground in front of us. 
we don't have time or bandwidth to look ahead. So how do we incorporate practices and strategies into our organizations that honors the workflow, but also gives people time to look up, to take a deep breath and see what's coming next. So think deeply about complex issues, imagine new possibilities, that's a big one, um, and make better choices. Three big themes of futures thinking. Next slide, please. Key components are the sensing piece of futures thinking, which is what is happening in here and out there. So if you do context mapping, if you do environmental scanning, there's a lot of similarities to that. Next slide, please. And then it's what could happen. So that's the scenario planning part of it. Next slide, please. And you play it out. So it does take some time the first time you do this, but you begin to look for these different kinds of scenarios. And the beauty of it is, and I know, I don't know if it's Midwestern, but sort of this notion that if I don't think about it, it can't happen. Well, I think 2020 taught us that it doesn't matter if you don't wanna think about it, it can and probably will happen. So what kinds of strategies or capabilities do we need to have in place? in order to be ready for that. And so it's sense making and it's thinking about what could happen next. As part of that, you need to be paying attention to the signals and trends around you, um, as well as, and Sarah mentioned this, the assets of your organization um, and the opportunities in front of you. Next slide, please. And then, Obviously, you want to spend some time saying, and what is it we want to make happen? What is our preferred future? And what would we need to do to get there? Next slide, please. In order to do good futures thinking, don't imagine that it disregards both what has gone before and what is going on now. Good futures thinking is like this triangle, and it is balanced, and it uh, gives weight to all three dimensions. Next slide, please. One of the great resources that I found recently, um, and I shared it with Brianne as well, but there is a really short book. Oh, yay, show and tell. Yeah, show and tell so you can see the cover of it. <laughs> if you're interested, it's about 50 pages of reading. It's really relatively brief, but it has really actionable tools in this that makes this accessible for any organization, any person or team for that matter. So Richard A.K. Lum wrote this book, Four Steps to the Future, and it's based on these principles. And we have to remember, there isn't a predetermined future. I'm Presbyterian, Protestant. I think we grew up being taught that there was a future. It was laid out and we were just gonna walk that path. We're all creating it. We're creating it in our organizations um, so how can we have some sense of um, our own agency in making uh, choices that impact the future? Next slide, please. And so um, Richard Lum lays out this relatively straightforward process. There are about five worksheets, really um, intuitive. Um, but it incorporates the past. So how have things changed? Um, the technical terms for this are looking at causal layered analysis, but it's essentially looking at what are the historical drivers of change in your environment or related to your issue? And then in terms of the present, what are the signals and trends, social, technological, environmental, um, political, um, emerging issues, and also, not just what's emerging, but what are the stabilities or the things that are holding uh, things in place, preventing change, resisting change. And then the futures part of it is, what are the alternatives? And you saw that little two by two matrix earlier, you know, what are potential alternatives? And what do you wanna do about that? What's your vision for going forward? 
So this doesn't have to replace what would be more traditional strategic planning, but particularly using uh, Richard Lum's tools, there's a way to integrate this into your everyday operating environment and to add a forward-looking layer to what may be pretty traditional operational planning, uh, business continuity planning, um, but it's more responsive to the changes in your environment. Um, and there are other ways to activate this so it becomes more um, iterative. But this is the heart of futurist thinking. Next slide, please. And the key ingredients for you and your organization are these four things. You do have to commit time and attention. That's essential. Um, really, curiosity is key and relatively high trust because this also connects to um, innovative cultures. You know, so there's going to be some stuff that you try and explore that doesn't work. There are going to be sensitive issues that you need to put on the table and an examine um, in a in as objective a way as possible. And you need diversity, not just life experience, but cognitive diversity to really uh, push yourselves to think uh, big. So next slide. And there is a payoff in this. One is we all wanna be future ready. None of us wanna feel like we're standing on the beach and the wave just washed, washed over us and we didn't even see it coming. We also all are conscious of needing to be more agile and adaptable because the environment is moving at a fast pace. And the context in which nonprofits are operating right now is increasingly complex and unpredictable. We all need to drive innovation and we all need to learn how to work in a more distributed leadership environment. Our work environment has changed in the last year um, remote work adds its own elements, but also the structure of our organizations, the increasing likelihood that we might be engaged with contract or gig workers or in an open organization require us to think and plan and explore in really different ways. And this, this model can help you do that. Next slide. Oh, that's it. That's all I had. I forgot. <laughs> Like question slide. Um, That's okay. We'll have time for we'll have time for questions. Um, that was that was perfect, Leslie. Good good timing. Um, we will keep you here in the main room then um, for more of a Q and A. Um, and then Sarah, I had you zoomed into room two. If folks are interested in kind of digging a little bit more into that tactical element of how IPCA put this into action. You gave us some of the high level, but, you know, would, would be uh, curious in that room, you know, if you wanted to share more about the challenge, any of the challenges and how you overcame those or, um, you know, how, how you framed this work differently than your strategic planning work with those stakeholders. Um, and then we have uh, room three, basically more of an open conversational thread <laughs> if you want to talk with others about how your organization is finding hope in the future. A little bit more broadly, um, you'd be welcome to connect with folks um, in room three to do that. So um, you don't need to, I don't think you need to indicate a number this time. Let's let's see what happens. Um, Barb, if you want to try opening up the rooms. Um, oh, let's see. Um, are folks getting a prompt to join uh, or choose a room or not? What do you guys they think? Are. They are? OK. <laughs> um, so let's see folks who are joining. Uh, Denise doesn't see a prompt. So let's see. I think people click on breakout rooms. OK, um, so you, a list will pop up. OK, thank you. We haven't tried this new version. We would we used to go old school. Um, <laughs> so I hope somebody joins Colleen in the hope hope in the future. There's at least one person in that one. Um, and so let's see uh, if anybody wants to talk. We've got we've got a great person. Oh, yep. Amy went in there. Cool. <laughs> We have at 
least two people. I just get nervous that someone would be in a room all by themselves and that doesn't feel like a lot of fun. So um, we still have a great many folks who are in the main room with us today and might have some questions for Leslie. I don't want to, um, I don't want to dominate. I'm sure I can ask some questions, but wanted to give some opportunity uh, for those folks who are on the call either to pop into the chat or come off of mute and use your, your, um, your audio and you can turn on your video um, to uh, add, um, let's see, uh, to ask a question. Let me see if I can get Sarah into group two. You got, we got her. Okay. All right. We're good. <laughs> this is always the part, <laughs> always the part that can get a little tricky. Um, so thanks for, for staying with us. And Sarah looks like she was moved. So it just isn't joined. Hmm. We're trying something new. Um, hey, and, um, hey, Brian, would yep. you be able, there, there, there are a couple people in the chat that mm -hmm. um, maybe yep. aren't having that option. Yep, they... I'm going to try and work on that. Why don't we just let uh, Leslie, while I'm working on that, uh, <laughs> um, maybe what's the most common question that uh, that you ask or ask as someone is looking to engage in this work? Um, I think most commonly people want to know how to integrate this into their ideas about traditional strategic planning. Um, and I, I think also people want to see concrete examples of how do you do this? And that's why I like Richard Lum's book because he puts together um, really easy to understand and intuitive worksheets that help you break it down. All of us all the time think about the history of our organizations, um, but we don't always capture it very effectively and then look at the source of changes that have impacted us. So, um, and, and I think another piece too is people get concerned that because of the name futures thinking that you sort of disregard the uh, weight of history or the realities of your everyday operating. Thank you for that. I, I like the idea that this isn't just kind of um, a, a stay on the shelf process. And we talked in our conversation a little bit too about really the ownership of this scenario planning um, and the knowledge staying with the organization versus the facilitator. Um, and, and that being one of the strengths of this framework. Can you share a little bit more about sort of that philosophy? Again, one of the things I like about particularly um, the processes Richard Lum has laid it out is, you know, these uh, yeah, steps can be integrated into an annual planning or reflection process. The other thing I like about it, and one of the reasons why I think that the um, capabilities get retained in the organization itself is because it gives you ways to engage people all across the organization and your stakeholders, particularly in the single signals and trends work. So what do you see coming? What's significant? What's keeping you up at night? Um, what's different than it was before? So there's some really good ways to practice all those engagement strategies that we know of, but typical strategic planning process doesn't always allow for. And so, you know, then you have the opportunity to take these artifacts and depending on the timing of your planning processes, maybe in the spring, you pull out your historical analysis and you, um, and you invite people to weigh in on what's changed since the last time we looked at this. Are there some new sources of you know the drivers of change. I'm using this process with uh, a regional group to look at disaster and anticipatory planning. So even we are gonna, in this case, we're gonna peg it to historical events and mm -hmm. say, you know, what's different at each of these different event horizons? Mm -hmm. And then 
you know, what are we hearing, seeing, having concerns about looking into the future? Mm -hmm. So you start to build that capability and you give people, part of this is you got to program it into your, um, your flow, your workflow, um, but it doesn't have to take days. It could be a quarterly um, check up kind of. Yeah. All staff conversation, board meeting, touch base. Mm -hmm. um, and then you look at, and here are the strategies we've put in place. What do we need to refresh? Where do we want to go from here? I know we have some great folks on the line, so please feel free to to ask your questions. I want to make sure you have the opportunity to talk with Leslie as much as I do. Um, Leslie, uh, while, while we're seeing if anybody wants to come off mute or raise your hand or however you want to indicate that you, you'd like to speak. Um, what how do you uh, how do you manage as a facilitator in this process, the power dynamics around um, you know, whose, whose voices or visions for the future are the loudest or mm. most heard? You know, I think that's always challenging. Um, process design matters a lot. Um, and I think one of the things that happens is that by taking this through sequential steps, you give people a little bit of distance right? This isn't your typical after action review where people say you screwed up. Instead, you're saying, what are the things that work in our environment? What do we know about what created change for us? Um, and if you tie it to asset inventories and things like that, you can shift the conversation to focus on where are our strengths? What are we good at? There's a, a concept out there called blue ocean. Where's our open space, our blue ocean for operating? Um, and then, you know, I think as you pull vision together, one of the things that Sarah did with the Primary Care Association is she broke people up into groups based on functional roles to give people a little space. Um, there are a number of tools you can do to, to give people some space, but also to give equal weight to different voices. Again, in this project in Lynn County, we're doing um, citizen interviews so we can bring voices into the conversation in ways that are equitable and safe. Um, there's a lot of work around psychology, psychological safety that you can bring into the conversation and the structure of uh, the process. That's great. Yeah, um, I think uh, another another question I have. You had mentioned, you know, the curiosity and the diversity and some of these these key components. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, the board diversity and some of the challenges there as organizations are, are I think, moving towards recognizing the value of diversity and the need. Um, do you have any recommendations for organizations that might not be there yet in how they can um, engage diverse voices and, and people, stakeholders in the work? Again, I think it's a matter of, you know, this is, a, this can be a really energizing discovery process. So, it might be that you want to ask yourself who's not in the room with us and who might have a different perspective on the history of in the source of changes um, or who might track be tracking different trends. So another strategy we're using here regionally is we've um, convened a futures council, um, diverse people who we're asking you know, to come together once a month or so to raise up. What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they attending to? So there are relatively, um, I don't wanna call them easy, but, but ways to infuse your process and your reflections with the voices of other people that you may not engage with all the time. I think particularly uh, sat in on a presentation last night around 
African American history in the United States, mm -hmm. you know, just doing the historical exercise where you ask people from where you sat at the time, how did you understand this event, mm -hmm. can really broaden your perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of ways to do this. Yeah, there's there's great work going on in our community right now. And I know many on the call are probably engaged um, in the 1619 Project, uh, then now when conversations. Um, and so the Greater Des Moines Leadership Institute has been um, convening. I, I mean, I think there were 500 people on the first call in our community uh, on, you know, each week covers a different topic. And so capitalism was the last week. and. Uh, there was a, a panel discussion and, and then folks were broken into, you know, one on one kind of parent shares and some reading and um, such a valuable exercise. I love the idea of your community having that futures council where where diversity is. Um, it's like the part of the key component of the recipe, but it isn't like necessarily this is a DEI kind of convening it's it's showing the value of diversity um and I don't know I'm I'm talking about soup now <laughs> no, well you know. I, I think there's a lot of um important synergies in these conversations right now and I, I happen to watch um a video of Otto Scharmer who um talks about leading from the emerging future. And he introduced a concept of just even helping people think about moving from um, this notion, uh, he used the example or the metaphor of, I'm wearing a jacket. And in this first way of thinking about the world, I am my jacket. This is what the world is like for everyone. And then you move into this awareness that um, I'm wearing a jacket and that, in fact, perhaps not everybody is wearing the same jacket. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you move into an understanding of and look at how many jackets there are in the world. So even as we think about history or our understanding of events, you know, how do we introduce that? That concept in and of itself gives people some, some safety. Mm -hmm. um, and the ability to um, imagine that they might try on another jacket. It doesn't mean they'd keep it. It doesn't mean it would necessarily fit them. But, you know, that that element of curiosity really is the transformative element. Um, continuing to practice discovery versus judgment um, and and good futures thinking again these are some auto Sharma concepts but you know how do you acknowledge and set aside vo the voice of judgment the voice of fear and the voice of cynicism mm -hmm. because so we are capable of so much more i love that it's it's so interesting that we have met and had the conversations we did exactly when we did because i had just read a uh, Otto Sharmer theory you <laughs> piece <laughs> right before. So we, we're uh, I, in the same uh, headspace maybe, but I love a good analogy and, and metaphor and that jacket is so, um, so helpful. And I think, you know, I'd mentioned this Margaret Wheatley book also at the beginning of the call and this, this idea of what it means to be a futurist and do futures work, it can feel, um, I don't know, really, uh, like you would have this imposter syndrome, right, <laughs> around it or or um, inaccessible, let's put it that way. Um, but, you know, I think so much of what you're talking about is connected to what Margaret Wheatley was talking about in the value of having conversations around some open-ended questions. Uh, you know, the, the one that she's talking about is, how are you restoring your hope in the future? And you know, if we can have a dialogue with a few people around that, there's there's so much uh, value <laughs> um, and we don't necessarily make space or time for those kinds of conversations, you know, within our communities or our organizations. So um, I love that. Thank you. And a lot of this is about, I also have a deep interest in how we help people be resilient um, in the face of increasing change. And 
Um, and so one byproduct of this is you look at history and you look at what contributed to change and you may begin to see the patterns of how we do influence the evolution of our organizations. We're not just riding along in the wagon. And then we also begin to see the opportunities for us to shape the future. Mm -hmm. um, that sense of agency and, you're talking about, yeah. And that's, that's important for all of us. Um, we can't control everything, but we can shape a lot of what happens next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'll uh, I'll pause because I'm not very good at that on Zoom. I don't like any dead air, but I know it is important to have a little white space here and there uh, for some of the thoughtful folks on this call to um, add their voices. And I'll I'll do that for a moment. And you never know, too, on Zoom if folks are just taking a nap, but. <laughs> now I'll also be interested in um, sort of the voice of cynicism. All of us uh, in our experience leading organizations have that uh, voice of yes, but. Um, so just know I'd love to have any kinds of conversations exploring this um with folks that they'd be interested in yeah kevin i see you came off of mute but i know you just zoomed back in with us did you have a a question or comment we're not we're not it's cool either way actually actually this is chad vogel i uh, kevin works for me and i grabbed <laughs> i i went on his calendar double clicked on this thing so. <laughs> Thank you very much. I joined so late. So here you are. All right. Wonderful. <laughs> well, I guess, Leslie, you know, you talk a little bit about that voice of cynicism. And uh, I think um, I, I I have like on each of my shoulders, maybe the voice of cynicism, <laughs> and the voice of hope and, and possibility. And so um, that that openness and curiosity that you talked about is something that I'm trying to to utilize to lean into. What, I think this is the good shoulder, <laughs> a little a little bit more uh, than the cynicism. But um, you know what what about that voice of like we've we've tried it before and it didn't work? Or you know is that a matter of like well what what factors were at play at that time that might be different than they are now? Yeah, I think it's um, part of it is uh, oftentimes we do extensive planning processes and uh, we put together our aspirational ideas, but we haven't always dug down deep into, you know, if we were successful in the future, what made that possible? Um, and I think it's Jim Collins or one of those organizational gurus who talks about, you know, the source of our success in the past is often the source of our failure in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the challenges that um, are facing us that we're, you know, our assets um, don't equip us to, to jump into in the future. And so reflecting on that and turning it into more of a, uh, a regular cadence of reflection and um, conversation and action is important because often too our strategic plans are done by smaller groups of folks mm -hmm. but then we expect the whole organization um, and our stakeholders these these distributed actors to carry this out mm -hmm. and so you may want to use a consultant to set this process up, to bring you into it, to help you sort of build that capability, but then you wanna build it into your organization. You know, for the most part, what we hear happening is three to five year strategic plans are getting harder and harder to justify because our world is shifting, but you still need to be strategic. You still need to be looking ahead and thinking about where you wanna head next. 
and giving yourself some guardrails for everyday operating. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you make that your own? How do you use tools that are intuitive? Um, and, and don't require learning some complex language or methodology. And that's part of what I like about this. Colleen, welcome. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks um, for adding your voice. Sure, sure. Um, Leslie, I was just sitting here um, thinking, um, could you talk about work that you've done with um, succession planning um, with your clients, if that's come up yet? I'm just thinking about, you know, strategic planning, succession planning, and, and organizations, and whether 2020 made some people think, I'm ready to retire, or I'm ready for a job change, <laughs> or I'm ready for a leadership change. So I was just curious how your work work applies um, uh, with that topic. So that is a frontier I have yet to cross, quite honestly. Um, I left United Way just last summer. So, um, but here's what I would tell you is using these tools and looking ahead at what are the capabilities we want to have access to? And then um, I heard a great um, presentation by Teresa Garcia, who's in your market from Wells Fargo. And then look at your business architecture. You know, what is the alignment of your organization? Um, is it well aligned? And how are your capabilities aligned within your organization? Whether you use StrengthsFinder or some other tool to think about how do we assemble those parts um, to move into the future? So often succession planning, my observation, this may only be true in Eastern Iowa, but succession planning uh, happens in crisis mode. And um, so we quickly rewrite a job description based on a template, you know, we have or we stole, and then we see who shows up um, versus that real interactive examination of here's where we've been, here's where we are now, here's where we want to go in the future, and, and what do we need to pack in our bag um, to get that? What kind of leadership do we need? Because that also can, you know, the nonprofit environment can be challenging because it's not just about you as a leader. I have a great idea I mean, maybe if you're a founder, that's true, but but you have a whole bunch of stakeholders that you need to bring along with you as you're navigating that. So this process can really be an interactive and engaging strategy for that. Thanks, Leslie. Um, and Colleen, I'm happy to share with you uh, some other resources that we have had on succession planning and some conversations. I know right, right as COVID hit, we did a training with um, Paul at the INRC around succession planning. It was our first uh, Zoom uh, webinar that we were doing. And um, one of the things we talked about or a, a, an emerging trend in the sector that I'm aware of is um, you know, the idea of sabbatical for leaders and um, you know the opportunity that that might provide for them to do some of this more uh, you know macro level environmental scan work <laughs> um, take a break from the day-to-day -day operations and then with that leadership um, you know, still there as a guardrail, but having um, the ability to then call up folks to sort of take over those those pieces in that time period, um, and that that is you know one tactic that the sector might start to embrace to combat burnout a little bit more um, too. And so, uh, I know the organization that my husband works at; they have a, a sabbatical model, which. Um, is really nice as far as like an employee retention <laughs> um, incentive as well. And it doesn't cost maybe as much money, uh, you know, I guess time is money, but um, let's, uh, it looks like we have folks who are coming back to us here. Um, so let's, put, well, first thank Leslie and Sarah for their time with us today. 
um, it was really exciting to see the comp, you know, all, all the people who wanted to talk about the nuts and bolts of the work that IPCA has put into place. And then also kind of the, the theories that undergird um, what Leslie's doing and, and how she's uh, imagining uh, the future's work. So um, thank you, Barb, if we could just put up the next couple of slides or the last few slides um, as we come back together. So I'm also going to do something that I haven't done lately, and I'm going to launch a poll for y'all. <laughs> um, I uh, am planning our March uh, session, and I know we, uh, I just want to know what you want. I want to do what you want. <laughs> so uh, please take a, a moment to reflect on what would be helpful and know that we can do both at some point. I just want to know what I should prioritize um, for you all as we have these conversations. So uh, looks like we're getting some good feedback. Give you a couple more seconds on that. And it's it's pretty neck and neck. Um, <laughs> uh, so we have a few more coming in. Give it a moment. But it looks like we're at, oops, see if that if that ended. We're at organizational effectiveness. I think just slightly inching out board diversity. Um, so, so we'll look at definitely, you know, bringing both of those, weaving both of those topics in. Um, I had some really exciting conversations over the past month or so around some board diversity initiatives that are happening in Eastern Iowa and um, even in Austin. So I think we can bring some of um, what we've learned together and then talk with some local leaders uh, as well on that topic and have also you know, seeing organizational effectiveness rising up um, as a sort of a next step for orgs as they're sort of in this long-term crisis, what's illuminating uh, these different pain points and how they're doing work. And um, I think that'll be great. So, well, with that, again, Leslie, thank you. Uh, we'll make sure uh, folks... In the reminder, um, we had sent Leslie and Sarah's websites, but if either of you want to pop your contact info into the chat um, for folks to reach out um, or partner in the future, feel free to do that. If anybody else um, from your organizations wants to share uh, any upcoming events or things that we should be looking forward to in the chat, I'd invite you to do that. Um, and we will really um, look forward to, to meeting again next month, first Wednesday. Thanks, everybody.